Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm so glad to be around the studio table with my friends and the segment I like to call at least two Jews and a Gentile. I have Trevor Rubenstein, Aaron Broughton, Matt Fry, and Tom Berkowitz. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great nice to be here. Always fun, always fun when we get to do this. I always want you to know that you can ask any question you like. You can text it over at any time. The number is 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. Let's talk about some of the Jewish high holy days. How were they? I know we've just they've just ended. And then let's put them in context of what's been going on in the world over the last year. Sure. We just wrapped up uh, what is known as the high holidays, high holy days, and... Um, one of the things I was thinking even before we got started is it's just worth noting, like, for us to orient ourselves around the Jewish calendar. Like, we say that, what do we mean? Um, when, when we talk about Jewish holidays, oftentimes uh, we're thinking in terms of what the scriptures would call moedim or appointed times. And and so you, you find these laid out really clearly, uh, not just in this place, but in this place specifically, Leviticus 23. In Leviticus 23, it talks about uh, the prescriptive holidays that Israel uh, is to observe. And so you've got uh, Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits and, and weeks. And then you, you, that's kind of all wrapped up into the spring. And then you get into the fall and you have uh, what we come to call the high holidays, which are uh, a concentration of some more annual holidays on the Jewish calendar. That includes the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, oftentimes called Yom Kippur, uh, and then the Feast of Booths, sometimes called Tabernacles, sometimes called Sukkot. And so we just got done the stint of going through Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and uh, tabernacles. And so it's a, a, a very intense time for the Jewish community, uh, oftentimes overlooked by uh, much of the church. But I think if we spend enough time just talking about what, what they are and what they mean to the Jewish people and, and how they relate to Jesus, uh, what we find is for us as believers, they would actually have a lot more value for us than we often ascribe to them. Mm-hmm. Thank right. you for that, Matt Fry. And just let everyone know who you are. Yeah, so I'm the lead pastor of Grafted Community a Church uh, in the area. We meet in Edina. Uh, our, our heart is to reach and serve and love the Jewish community and see them come to faith in Jesus and live that out in the broader body of Jesus. And I also serve as a staff missionary along with uh, Trevor here with Chosen People uh, Ministries. Thank you very much. Yep. You know, Matt, you started off in Leviticus 23 because that's where it has all of them. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting, we call it the appointed times in Moedim, and the, what they start off with first is the Sabbath. Mm. For six days you may work, work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. So we do have the four spring and the, and the three fall, mm-hmm. but every week there is an appointed time that we are to remember God. Right. Thank you for that, Tom Berkowitz. Tell everyone about you. I'm the executive director of the Messianic Journey, teaching the Bible through Jewish eyes in the context it was written. All right. Well, speaking of the fall feasts of Israel, our family, I'm Aaron Broughton, by the way, pastor of Victory Baptist Church in Maple Grove, Minnesota. And uh, our family served in Israel for several years, and the fall feasts were very... Um, it's definitely an important time actually living in the land where uh, it's really part of just the society here in, in the United States, Jewish community kind of, you have to think about, okay, it's, you got the regular calendar and then the Jewish calendar, make sure we don't miss it type of thing. But as far as in Israel, it's just part of the flow of, of life and even of our ministry there. And it's a time that we often look forward to the, the uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish new year. Uh, 5785 is the year now. And uh, so it goes back 
to the creation of the world. That's kind of where it's based from. Ten days later, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's the highest holy day on the Jewish calendar. And then shortly after that is the Feast of Tabernacles. It goes for a whole week. Uh, families especially, I love our Israeli community where they would build a, a booth, a sukkah, uh, and you would, for seven days, uh, you you sit under it, you have your meals in there, you can even stay overnight. Think of like camping. <laughs> and it's to remind them, of course, of the life of the children of Israel in the wilderness. But we always enjoyed it, got together with our Jewish friends, which were like family to us, go there for meals. And um, it, was a, it was really a time of thanksgiving to God, a time of reflection, a time, a call to repentance as well. And uh, so, it, really an amazing time. You know, it's interesting. You said this year 5785. The other day I was going through a devotion. And on that day, and I can't remember if it was October 2nd, 3rd, or 4th, they said, this is the day that this one scholar said was the start of the earth. It was like October 3rd, uh, 4,000. 4 B.C. Mm. So, but somewhere in there, we lost 240 days, is it? 250 Some, days? Something like that. Yeah, ch- calendar's been changed and modified a few <laughs> times throughout the years. There's, there's mm-hmm. no math on this show, just so you know. <laughs> well, that's the math. extent of my math. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and uh, and uh, so there's there's an importance to the sequence of events, and uh, and I think that this really plays into... Um, just really our life with the Lord and how we connect to him because because it starts off with the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Trumpets really it has to do with announcing of something big coming. Um, we read about this, for example, in the book of Ezekiel where Ezekiel talks about an instance where watchmen, these are individuals that are standing up on top of hills and would overlook cities, and if they see the enemy coming, they blow their trumpets. Also in the in the New Testament scriptures and throughout, you hear about when God's coming, he comes at the sound of a trumpet. So the trumpet is is announcing something big coming. And, and then it leads into the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. And, uh, and so this is Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, because the day of atonement is when the people of Israel were instructed to go through a process in which they would have their sins, their transgression, their iniquity atoned for so that they could be forgiven. And then tabernacles or Sukkot has to do with dwelling in the presence of God. And so you're going through this sequence of God is coming, we have to be made right before him, and we humbly come before him, and then we dwell in his presence afterward. Hmm. So when we read... No, please, Matt. I was going to say, when we read the New Testament, part of the reason this is a value is because this seems to be what the the prophets would uh, hearken to and what the New Testament picks up on uh, when it comes to... Uh, how God uh, works in the end times. When we read the Apostle Paul, he's talking about the return of Jesus being with uh, a trumpet blast, right? When we read Romans uh, 11, we're seeing this dynamic of uh, many Israelites, a national turning of Israel. Some would call that a, uh, a national day of atonement, that there will be a time that comes when many, uh, many more Jewish people than we see now are atoned for on the grounds that they finally trust in this Messiah who was announced with the trumpet blast. And then finally, when we read the book of Revelation, uh, we, we see not only the messianic kingdom, but also the new creation where the king is dwelling among his people. And so that trajectory that, that Trevor just kind of laid out is actually something that we see uh, will come to pass in a fuller sense uh, when Jesus comes back. Yeah, and, and we know that the uh, earlier um, festivals of Israel, mm-hmm. uh, so starting with uh, Passover, then unleavened bread, and yeah. then uh, first fruits and leading into weeks, uh, that those were all fulfilled with Jesus' first coming. Of course, uh, we understand that he dies on the Passover, he raises from the dead on first fruits, mm-hmm. the Spirit of God comes on weeks. And so there's this pattern that the Lord uses these festivals not just simply as days of of uh, remembrance or days of looking f- of days of uh, of fulfilling something but also prophetically and so to Matt's point um these later festivals seem to all point to his second coming and there's a there's an in between time period um and that in between time period would be in the time that we're in now between his first and his second t- coming because there's 3 months where there are no festivals listed um within uh, Leviticus chapter 23 yeah 
So was Yom Kippur the last uh, event, or was it Sukkot? Sukkot was Su- the last. Was the last. Right. Okay. So f- when you think of Yom Kippur, that was what October 11 and 12, right around there. Yeah, we celebrated roughly. it at Grafted. It was era of Yom Kippur, so the evening started it, and that was the 11th. Okay. So can you talk about some of the traditions and rituals associated with Yom Kippur? Yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty somber day. That's uh, what I thought. Traditionally speaking, like I remember even growing up in, in a synagogue myself, right? This is the time, whether whether you would consider yourself uh, particularly religious in your observance uh, or not, this is the time when many Jewish people will go to the synagogue out of obligation. Like this is a time where if you're going to identify with your Jewishness in any religious sense, this is when you are going to do it. And so you dress up in your, your nicest clothes. And I remember the the, the uh, synagogue I used to go to, they would rent out like the river club because they just couldn't hold all the Jewish people that would just show up. Wow. And so, um, you're, you know, you're standing there, you're, you're going through a number of prayers, you're doing uh, the traditional uh, normal services on, on a Shabbat service and more. Um, you're, you're confessing sin, you're doing that communally, you're doing that quietly, you're beating your chest in repentance, uh, you're fasting is a normal thing. There's... Um, uh, you guys might remember the name of it. I remember. I know there's a, a whole section of the service that is oriented around kind of uh, dissolving the oaths that you've made. That you have. What is that called? It starts with an uh, an N, or it might be a nun in in Hebrew. Whatever it is, there's there's all these dynamics of of you're really freeing yourself up, right? You're 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 repenting and you're trusting that you're you are free from your sin, that your sin is atoned for, that that you're made right. Uh, with God again. And, and so that goes all the way through. And then once Yom Kippur is over, then you break the fast. And one of the ways that you traditionally would break that fast is with, uh, was it salted herring or something like that? So that you're, you're, you get thirsty and then you're forced to replenish all those fluids. So there's actually like a biological component to it. Um, but it is a, it is a unique time of the year to say the least. And it is a time where for the Jewish community, I think as Aaron made reference to, uh, they're really thinking deeply uh, about uh, the things that matter. They're standing before God, um, their own sin. Uh, and, and I think that that's a good thing, like for, for us as believers, look, looking in on that, uh, honoring the fact that they're, they're thinking about repentance and sin and, and Lord willing for that leading to conversations about, okay, you, you come before God and hope for atonement. What's the means by which atonement's provided? I'm fascinated. Is your heart in the right place? I mean, I can go to, let's say a Christmas service and I can look around and I right. can I can tell there's, you know, I, some people that maybe show up once a year and they're checking the box. Yeah. Is that the same case, uh, Yom Kippur? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> it can be for sure. Right. May, maybe even more so uh, because uh, as, as Matt was saying, um, it's the one time a year that all the people can't fit in the service. Well, yeah. And then he's saying they repent of their sins and beat their chest. And I'm going, is that for real? Yeah, because uh, because it's it is so you know often we'll hear from Christians as to well how do the Jewish people think that they receive forgiveness? Yeah, um, and uh, and there's different ways, right? So uh, whether that be giving to charity or whether that be repenting, you know, there's there's different components that the Jewish people think that they're doing today that now have replaced sacrifices. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but Yom Kippur really is the day in which they see this occurring, that this forgiveness occurs. I, I can always tell in my family when uh, Yom Kippur is coming up because I'll hear from family members apologizing for something <laughs> because you're, you're supposed to, <laughs> you're suppo- you do. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to repent before other family yeah, members, right. uh, before the day comes, uh, because you're hoping that then the Lord will, uh, receive your forgiveness and then you will pr- be preserved for another year and expedite the process. Uh, correct. Yeah. And, uh, and it's very limiting actually. Um, there's a, there's an element to Yom Kippur, um, that's, uh, that's addressed in the book of Hebrews because uh, what Yom Kippur is accomplishing, and you can read about this in uh, Leviticus chapter 16, it, it's, it's actually so that the people physically wouldn't die when they were in the presence of God. Uh, Because it starts off by saying that when Aaron's sons came into the presence of God in an unholy way that they died, so do this. Um, And so it was for their physical lives. It was for the people of Israel. It actually offered forgiveness for the people of Israel and for one year. And so a question that comes, okay, so if this is going to work for the people of Israel, uh, then what are we going to do for the world? If this is going to work for one year, what are we going to do for eternity? And if this works so that we physically don't die, what are we going to do for our eternal souls? 
uh, which of course leads to a much greater sacrifice, a much greater intercessor, which we know is Jesus. Yeah. You know, if you are by a ultra orthodox neighborhood and you see them during the 10 days of awe going casting bread out on a creek or on some kind of living water, they take that from Micah uh, 719. Yes, we will cast all their sins into the depth of the sea. Yeah. So symbolically, the bread being cast on the water is their sin. They have a lot of maneuvers. And they say today they have atonement for their sin because of their repentance, like Trevor right. said, or their charity or giving of money. But... Yeah. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That's Leviticus 17.11. And they try to, no matter how much you talk around it, in the Torah, the first five books, repent for every time they talk about repentance, there's 17 times about the shedding of blood, the sacrifice that covers the sin. So they have a problem. Yeah, I'm learning so much, Tom. I thought they were just feeding the ducks. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's interesting bringing that up from, so from a Gentile perspective, you know, we read the the Bible through Gentile eyes, forget it's a Jewish book, but when we look at Jewish cultures and customs, I think this is a conversation very helpful. Uh, back during the Middle Ages, there were, especially in Europe, there were a lot of um, Gentile Christians, if you would, that saw Jewish people doing that. They were casting their bread in, in the lakes or the rivers and all that. And there were some libels that were going around saying that the Jews are poisoning the water supply. And that actually increased anti-Semitism. So, uh, and a lot of it was there was a Gentile misunderstanding of what was taking place and what the Jewish mm. people were trying to do. Mm. And so, I think it's it's important for us culturally to understand kind of what's going on, kind of taking a, a good look at this. That this is a serious time for the Jewish Jewish people, uh, and because you have the from Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, the ten days of all you're preparing for the high holy day. And praying, yes, that your, in fact, there's a custom, you say, may your name be inscribed in the book of life. And so you want God's favor. So, yeah, you want to confess sins or any misdeeds and uh, even unknown deeds that you've done. And uh, you pray that God would write your name in for another year. Hmm. All right. Let me take a little break. You're listening to at least two Jews and a Gentile. I've got Trevor, Aaron, Matt, and Tom. If you have a question or comment, I welcome it. 877-933-2484. Be right back. Well, it seems like just yesterday there was a presidential election. You believe it's been four years, and here we are again. And, of course, there's some tension, there's some anxiety, and we need to be uh, joined together in prayer and in unity for peace and for God's will to be done in this oftentimes fearful and divided uh, time in our country. Uh, If you want to head over to MyFaithRadio.com and text the word VOTE to 877-933-2484, you can get an election prayer guide. So glad you tuned in today. It is time for at least two Jews and a Gentile. I have Trevor, Aaron, Matt, and Tom. We're talking about High Holy Days. And to this point, you've given me a lot to think about. And I need help connecting some dots because during the break, we were talking about the last day of Sukkot last year was when the war began. And the the first day of Sukkot this year is when Yahya Sinwar was killed. Now, Coincidence? Planned? You tell me. I don't think it's any coincidence. I mean, if you look at the book of Ezra, when they came back from exile and they made, uh, they finished the temple, it happened on Passover. They celebrated the Passover in chapter 6. It was the biggest celebration of Passover uh, since Joshua. Then... Uh, on the first day of celebration for the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8, happened to be on Sukkot. Yeah. Mm. And so they read there, and the people, 
at first when they heard the word, because they found the word and they were reading from Deuteronomy, they ripped their clothes because they heard the word of God and they realized they hadn't been obedient. So they went and built the sukkahs, the temporary shelters where they'd live. And I mean, Nehemiah 8 a good. So it's always been that cycle. The cycles of the feasts are very important in history. So it's no surprise that it's also very important today. Yeah. Yeah. It's also when Solomon dedicated the temple. The first temple was right. on Sukkot. On yeah. Sukkot. Yeah. Yeah. And Sukkot's the only one of the feasts that we know from Scripture that survives into the millennial kingdom from mm-hmm. Zechariah 14. Yeah. Do you have that pulled up, Aaron? Zechariah? Zechariah 14. Yeah. yeah. You wonder, do you know where that is, that text? Yeah, he has yeah, it's, it's in, it's it's in, in the in end of the Hebrew Bible. Well, well, at least the English Bible. <laughs> anyway, I'm helping I out. Have asked. Yes. I should not have asked. Uh, what's interesting is, okay, you have the three high holy days, and really you could kind of say that Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets, you see that highlighted here in Zechariah 12. The Day of Atonement, that's Zechariah 13. Uh, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, that's in Zechariah 14. It's really interesting to see how that that goes out in succession. But it says at the very end of Zechariah 14 that we will go up year to year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Uh, and that's not just for Israel, but that's for the nations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they will, in fact, the, the Bible says that the nations that do not go up to Jerusalem to Sukkot, they will not receive rain uh, for that, that year. And so, in other words, it, it, the rain is a symbol of God's blessing. And, um, and so, in other words, if you want to know, if you want to go to the presence of the Lord, uh, you go up to Jerusalem. The children of Israel had those privileges uh, to do that, and now it's, it's extended to the nations. Yeah. Every day on Sukkot, they would sacrifice the bulls and the animals and stuff, add it up to 70. And from Jewish thought that there's 70 nations in the world. So that is one of the feasts where... Th- they absolutely sacrificed and prayed for the nations that they might yeah. know the living God. An yep. interesting historical fact, Ty, there's actually two his- historical facts. One you bring up, Trevor, and one that, that comes to mind for me uh, is many people, uh, whether you've celebrated it or not, are familiar with uh, Hanukkah, which is not uh, a, a festival or a celebration that is directly prescribed in, in the Torah, but it is observed in Scripture uh, but many people think uh, that the celebration of Hanukkah, because it's you know, over eight days and Sukkot has this kind of seven day and an extra day on the end, um, it is actually uh, that Hanukkah is modeled after Sukkot, that when the Maccabees were able to throw off the oppression uh, of the Seleucids in the t- time between the Testaments, uh, that they actually modeled their celebration after this time. And it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. But Trevor, you had brought up something during grafted Sukkot celebration uh, about Thanksgiving. Yeah. And that was interesting. Yeah. So, well, it, and kind of building off of what you were saying first, Matt, to where, uh, to where the reason that that connection is made is because every time they dedicated the temple, it was on Sukkot, and that took eight days. And so when they had to rededicate it during Hanukkah, yeah. it took eight days. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the pilgrims, um, actually, they, they would not celebrate uh, Christmas or Easter because they didn't see it in the Scripture. So they were very much biblicists. Um, and they actually would condemn people that did. And so uh, what happens is, you know, then you wonder, okay, so what were they doing when they celebrated Thanksgiving? One possibility, um, which there is, uh, there's some uh, leanings in that direction, is that they were actually doing a, a Sukkot or Tabernacle celebration. It's actually the, it's the final harvest of the food, and it's an ingathering of the nations. And so if they're looking to do something that's both an ingathering of the nations, where of course they were inviting the Native Americans to it too, and it was during their final harvest, it sure makes sense that it lines up with this Hmm. uh, because they only would have done things that they found in Scripture historically. Um, But going back to your original question, Bill, uh, maybe maybe one of the reasons that that, uh, the attack on Israel happened on the eighth day, right, is because it was prescribed as a... Sabbath day so that the people of Israel weren't mm. rest, weren't working. And uh, and often, actually, Israel's enemies will try to attack them on days where they're supposed to be resting um, because they they assume that they might catch them off guard. And uh, maybe that even contributed at some level to uh, to what happened with the security lapse. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, the 
with the head of Hamas dying on the first day of the uh, ingathering. Um, it's, uh, and, and I, I don't know any prophetic significance offhand, but, uh, uh, but it, it would speak, I think, clearly to the people of Israel and, uh, and probably give them some form of assurance that, uh, that they have not been completely forsaken. Well, one little thing to add on that, Trevor, is, um, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles, like I said, it's time of things. Give us a time. In fact, one of the commands is to rejoice. It's a command to do that. How do you rejoice when Israel has been under so much duress over the past year? They're still under rocket attacks, still under reeling from the death. We still have about 100 hostages still kept in Gaza right now. How can you rejoice? And so the fact that Yahya Sinwar was, was eliminated that first day of Sukkot, all of a sudden, in a way, it's a cause to rejoice. And so there is, if you want to say, a silver lining uh, in this this uh, current uh, High Holy Days. All right. Question came in on the text line. As a believer, are we supposed to celebrate all the Jewish holidays only or with others? Well, we celebrate Easter and Christmas that are not in the Bible. Passover, uh, first fruits, mm-hmm. uh, feast of weeks are in the Bible. And so yeah. is Tabernacles, so is Yom Kippur, and so is Feast of Trumpets. Now, as believers on Yom Kippur, we're praying for the unsaved. Mm-hmm. We have salvation, but yeah. Jesus is our covering. He yeah. is our atoning. He's our Kippur. Yeah. yeah. The way that I process this, at, at least with our people, and, and some people may have a different conviction on this, and I'm completely okay with that, but... Uh, the way that I process it is by asking the question of, of what is the purpose or, or what is the, the function of the law of Moses in which we have Leviticus, which prescribes these feasts, right? And, and the law, uh, not exclusively, but, but in a lot of ways, uh, laid out the stipulations of what the covenant looked like uh, for Israel to walk out their life of obedience and, and, and relationship uh, with the Lord. And so, so for them, when they're looking at it, like these are the stipulations of what our partnership looks like with God. But when we read Jeremiah 31, what we see is that believers in Jesus, uh, because he has fulfilled the law, they come under a new covenant. And that doesn't like erase the law. It doesn't mean the law doesn't matter. Jesus says he came to fulfill it, not to uh, abolish it. Uh, But it does mean that he has indeed fulfilled it. And so when we think about these celebrations, the way that I talk about it with our people is that we do it uh, out of invitation and not out of obligation because they are not stipulations on our covenant with the Lord. Our stipulations are faith in Jesus, right? And then expressed in walking out as the Apostle Paul Paul would say it, the law of Christ, and that could be a whole other uh, episode. But but when I think about these, it's not that we have to do them; it's that we get to do them. And and Colossians two really points us well in this direction. Where am I reading your mind over there? Uh, Colossians two points us well in this direction, where it says that don't let anyone judge you. Right, new moons or feast days or Sabbath, and and in Paul's mind, these surely have to be on his mind to some degree. And he says they're they're shadows of which Jesus is the substance, and so there is value. In obs- I don't know if I'd even use the word observe, uh, remembering, maybe celebrating or participating in some of these uh, because they, they give us a moment to look back at the shadows, which give us the categories that help us more fully understand Jesus, the substance. And so to, to sum it up for the, the questioner, uh, you can do it. You don't have to do it, but, but you get to do it and there might be value in it. You know, I like looking at threads in the Bible and it talks a lot about in the Torah about the appointed times. And I think we have to look at the genesis of that. I'm saying that tongue in cheek because in Genesis 1.14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate day from night and let them be for signs and for appointed times mm. and for days in a year. So when God created it, he put, seasons in there for the appointed times. So it was important to him. Therefore, I think it should be important to the church. Nicely done. All right, we're going to take a little break and be right back with at least two Jews and a Gentile. I have Tom, Aaron, Matt, and Tom ready to take your questions if you have one. 877-933-2484. Got a couple of great questions that are on the, the board. We'll get to them when we come back.
It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time, let's get it started. Jump in your car, what's for dinner? It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Welcome to the show. It's at least two Jews and a Gentile. I've got Trevor, Aaron, Matt, and Tom. And we are uh, just during the break. Trevor, or uh, Aaron, you told the greatest story, and I said, I insist you retell it. <laughs> we were just talking about, uh, a listener had a question about whether or not we should uh, keep or practice the, the High Holy Days, for example, mm-hmm. the Feast of Israel. Uh, and to what the men have said, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, a way to celebrate it, may, maybe not observe it. That's the, the difference I use as well. But I'd like to say this. In Colossians chapter 2, uh, Paul does deal with this, that these are really a shadow of things to come, but the body are the substances of Christ. And so um, when my wife and I first met, I actually did my internship with her parents in, in Israel, actually. I knew about her. I saw her picture on the wall. That was about it. But about a year or so later, uh, through a, I would say, providence of God, um, she actually called me trying to get a hold of uh, her parents who were with me at the time. And we talked for a while, exchanged phone numbers. We started calling each other, and these conversations went to like an hour, two hour, three hours. Okay, there's something going on here. She finally, about three or four months later, sends me a picture of herself, which, wonderful. I have a picture of this this girl who, I tell you what, she looks pretty nice. Three or four months later, I got to finally meet her in person. And here she was, the real deal. That's my wife, Mandy. And so in looking at that comparison with what's going on here, the feasts that we see here are really a picture of the real deal. That's Jesus. And I think what can happen, we, there's a danger, and Paul warns about that. We can be so in love with the picture of the feasts that we forget the person of the feast, and that's in Jesus. With my wife, I, wasn't, I'm, I didn't marry or fall in love with the picture of Mandy. I fell in love with the person of Mandy. And that's exactly what Paul is challenging us, is that we should not be bound to legalism of, of adding to what Jesus said. In fact, what they're saying is that Jesus' work on the cross was not sufficient, is what they're doing. They don't deny Jesus, but they kind of dethrone him from the sufficiency of Christ. And so this is exactly what this is about. So be in love with the person of Jesus, not just the picture. So good. So good. Thank you for that, Aaron. Aaron Broughton. All right. Let me uh, ask this question. This came in on the text line. If the high priest wore a rope and bells when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year in case God killed him because of his own sin or wickedness, why weren't Annas and Caiaphas killed? They were taking advantage of the Jews for years. Oh, you know, really interesting question. Um and uh, and I think that this is an important one, even uh, uh, theologically and uh, as far as um, apologetics, too, because um, the presence of God was never listed to be in the second temple in the same way in which it was in the first temple. Oh. Uh, because in the first temple, and we actually read about this in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, um, where it says, that the the glory, the kabod of God, that it came down and it actually consumes the items that were offered on the altar. And we have no record of any of these things in the New Testament scriptures. But but some of the prophets spoke that there was going to be greater glory. <coughs> in, in, excuse me. Uh, greater glory in the... Uh, uh, in the second temple than there ever was in the first. This is in Haggai chapter 2. And in Haggai chapter 2, it says this, uh, starting in verse 6. This is what the Lord, uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, once more, um, I will shake the heavens and the earth, in the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations that in desired by the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold. glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, 
declares the Lord Almighty. So what we have here is uh, Haggai says that the the glory of God was going to be mightier in the second temple than it ever was in the first, but yet the presence of God wasn't there. So what has to happen here is this is proof that the Messiah himself had to come into the second temple Mm -hmm. uh, because it's the only way that the glory of the second temple could have been greater than the first where we had that presence. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's why they would not have passed away. All right. Plus, those two guys weren't priests. They bought their position. They weren't even of the line of uh, Aaron. Okay. Trevor, I have to confess something uh, just to clear this. We've got a lot of people in the studio right now, and the microphones are all over the place. And I have uh, this little box here that has a cough button. And my cough button is connected to your microphone. So when I hit the cough button to turn my head to cough, I cut you out. Yeah, I noticed. So would you just... Repeat everything you said the last 12 minutes. <laughs> it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. Hey, Haggai chapter 2, yeah, glory yeah. of the second temple greater than the first. God's presence was never in any known sense in the second temple unless the Messiah had come before it was destroyed in 70 AD. One more thing, Bill, just to add to that is the question is a very good question. It's a very, very observant of the text. Uh, but there, there is one thing missing, and it's that on the day of Yom Kippur, the high priest didn't wear those things that the person had asked. Oh, uniquely on the day of Yom Kippur, uh, they put on very simple, humble linen garments. It was just four pieces. Yeah, it was yep. super simple. On the other days, totally, they were decked out, right? Interesting. Nines, but on on the day of Yom Kippur, they didn't wear those things, or mm-hmm. at least when they went into the the holy of holies. Hmm. Another question: Is there a study Bible that has the Messianic Jewish perspective. We love this conversation with your guests. How nice is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And of course there is, right? Yeah. So there, there is a study Bible that I believe is called, and I'm looking it up here now, Bill, but I believe it's called the Messianic Jewish Study Bible. Um, and this was uh, put out by... Uh, by I he thought was I was muted there again for a second. But no, this it's not Stern. It's uh although Stern has a Jewish New Testament commentary. Is it the um, complete Jewish study Bible? Correct. That's what it is? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that one's not bad. When people ask me this question, and this is maybe gonna just like give my hand away and, and maybe ruffle feathers and everyone can push back on me in the room and I'm okay with that. When people ask me for um something that is like messianic Jewish that they can understand it more. The, what I usually say is this, because sometimes we'll even ask for like a Messianic Jewish translation, right? And and what I would say is most modern translations that we have are really good, and they don't need one that is uniquely inclined towards Jewishness unless they have a particular interest in like pronouncing Jewish words. And if that's the case, you should just learn Hebrew. But when we think about Messianic Jewishness, I guess the sub-question to that would be this is, are are we interested – uh, in learning about like Jesus as the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible or are we interested, like what's the particular interest? And if that's the particular interest, most good evangelical study Bibles, like I, I'll think just like the ESV study Bible or something like that, they do a pretty good job at actually navigating some of those things and even navigating some of the ancient Jewish world. Uh, but if you want to go deeper, I, I think Trevor's right. The the complete Jewish study Bible, David Stern did a New Testament uh, the Jewish New Testament commentary, I yep. think is what it's called. Um, there, there's some good ones, but I always encourage people uh, that most uh, modern day evangelical study Bibles actually do a really good job at, at pointing back to that ancient Jewish context if they spend enough time doing it. That's not to dissuade the, the questioner. It, it's just to say sometimes we can be looking for something uniquely Jewish, but it's not about looking at modern-day Judaism. It's about thinking about ancient Judaism, and most commentaries do that well if they're worth their salt. Hmm. Do you and, guys are aware of the Tree of Life version? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You like it? Uh, I, I personally use it um, sometimes, and if I'm looking at, uh, well, especially like Colossians 2, talking about what to do with the feast days and interested on that. I think sometimes even the Tree of Life uh, study Bible, where it can be helpful, sometimes it does throw people off, like Matt was saying, with the Hebrew words. And, for example, if you're going to talk to your Gentile neighbor, you know, or, you know, uh, using this, it will probably, like, cause more confusion. Like, oh, what are you talking about? What is, you know, this word? What's the Ruach HaKodesh, for example, which is the Holy Spirit? Uh, why don't you just yeah. say the Holy Spirit, you know? Right. So I would say it depends on the context you're in for its usage. Hmm. Yeah, it was, One I'd recommend 
is the Bible background commentary. In the New Testament, Craig Keener Mm -hmm. is the author. He looks at it, and I think Walton, I can't remember. Walton and uh, Chavez or something like that. It starts with C-H is the last name of the other guy. But they have two-volume series. Yeah, it's the InterVarsity Press Bible background commentary. Yeah. All right. If you have a question or comment, let us know what you have. 877-933-2484. We're going to take a little break and we'll be right back, at least two Jews and a Gentile. Don't go anywhere. We carry each other's burdens. Please know you can bring us your prayer concerns and we will pray. Share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio team by texting or calling 877-933-2484 or share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio staff and listeners at MyFaithRadio.com. Welcome back to the show. It's at least two Jews and a Gentile. All right, here's a question. Gentlemen, how do blended Gentile and Jewish Messianic congregations address concerns? Uh, Like I was going to just ask if I could participate in one of the Jewish celebrations. Well, I'm wondering, just based on the question, if the answer when he was going to ask was no, right? I'm trying to to sort out how that was received, right? Yeah. I would say I would I would come back to what I had said earlier, right? Like there is a value in Christians, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, in in participating, uh, celebrating, however you want to use that language, uh, in these things because they reinforce your faith in Jesus. And so, if you're Jewish, then this is by definition your ethnic heritage that you're participating in. So there's ethnic value in it and spiritual value in it in terms of pointing you to your Messiah. If you're a Gentile, if you're non-Jewish, uh, then the the Apostle Paul would still say that uh, this this faith of Abraham is still your spiritual heritage by faith in Jesus. And, and so there is value in understanding the Jewishness of Jesus because it helps you to understand Jesus, right? It, that's that's the point at the end of the day is it's all about Jesus. And so, I you know, for the, the guy who had— uh, you know, r- wrote the question. I don't know if he had a negative experience, and if he did have a negative experience, that's um, that's unfortunate. And actually, I'd love to connect with him and, and hear more about that, and, and see if I could help him navigate that. But uh, in in our congregation, in the way that we do it, and Aaron, maybe if you want to speak to yours too, uh, when we have Jews and non-Jews coming together to do things that are by definition Jewish, you just make it clear that like doing these doesn't make a non-Jewish person Jewish. Uh, and for a Jewish person, doing these doesn't make you holier. It's Jesus that is the one that knits you together, and you're both celebrating in this for the value of uh, they, they point you to him, right? And so it, it's a good thing, and people should be invited to participate in that. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. At our church, we do uh, like Passover, for example. We have a Hanukkah party, just different elements like that, that we invite our Jewish and Gentile friends to join us for that. But again, our purpose, like Matt said, is we want to point people to Jesus. We want them to understand what the scriptures are all about and uh, to have a a deep love also for the Word of God. And uh, it also helps us create a cultural understanding, too, of uh, Jewish and Gentile neighbors. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen. um, Is the promise of eternal hope a little muted in the Old Testament? What do you mean by muted? Well, I mean, I think in in light of Hebrews, the the patriarchs had this eternal hope. And I I think we, it seems like we hear about it more in the New Testament than the Old. You're talking about like uh, salvation and eternal life and all of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, You you can say, Aaron's got something good in a sec and and it's probably better than mine. Uh, (laughs) But but I I was just going to say that revelation is progressive. Right? And so God is speaking to his people over time in cultures and in history, mm-hmm. and, he's, and he's in some ways, I don't know if this is the right language, but accommodating them. He's speaking to them in terms that they would understand, right? Uh, and, and so over time in different cultures, he's revealing progressively different amounts of information. But, but I do think that there are things clearly in, in the Hebrew Bible 
uh, that would, would give reference to eternal life. I think about Psalm 17, where, where the author says, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness, the sense of being reunited with God. I think of uh, Daniel chapter 12, those uh, c- you know, those condemned to or, or eternal condemnation versus, uh, versus eternal life. And there's this double resurrection to different eternal destinies. And so there, there are references to it. You might say it's maybe less uh, uh, consistent, like it doesn't come through. It's maybe not the main focus all of the time, but you do see that God is still pointing his people in that direction consistently. I'd just add on to what you just said, Isaiah uh, 26, 19 says, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. So it's talking about a resurrection there. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you go back to the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, man had was in the presence of God. And uh, eventually we're, we're going to get to that at the very end of Revelation, of course. But you see glimmers of hope. You see Enoch, who was, he was translated. He was caught up to God uh, to be with him. But I think a, a classic illustration, especially at the very beginning, is you go to Abraham. When he died, it, the Bible says that he was gathered to his people He was or, or gathered to the fathers. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear that, especially in the Old Testament in the, uh, like concerning the patriarchs. And so there's an expectation of well, who was Abraham gathered to? His family was buried in other places, and uh, remember, he he has the cave of Machpelah where Sarah's buried. So who is his people? And I think this is his expectation. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He had that eternal hope, as, as we've been talking about. So he had, I believe, Abraham had an expectation of the afterlife in the presence of God. And that was along with those that were a part of the faith of Abraham as well. Mm-hmm. And I think if you... Jewish writings will talk about this, the Talmud and stuff, but in Joshua seven nineteen, Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to God of Israel and give praise to him. Now tell us what you have done. And the idea that the Talmud says, if you confess that sin, you're still going to punish and and die. But when the Messiah comes, you can have life because you ask for forgiveness. Yeah, and, and from the very beginning, uh, we see this hope and promise of, uh, of, the, of the Savior that God was going to send, right? And something is called the Proto-Evangelion, right? It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, and between your offspring and hers. I will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So here's the idea is the woman would have a child, a descendant, and that descendant would destroy the work of Satan in the garden. And this the work of Satan was death and separation from God, and that he would this uh, this seed of Eve then herself um, would be struck. And so, and so we have this, this, uh, continued narrative going through again, the promises of David, that he would have a son that would rule and reign forever, uh, which, which clearly speaks towards eternal life, having a King that rules and reign forever. So no, it's, it's, it's throughout the scriptures, although it is not explicitly revealed in an abundant, clear way, um, immediately. Right. And Paul talks about that in first Corinthians 15 and he's, Hinting a remez back to uh, Isaiah 25, 8, where he says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and reproach of his people. He will take away from all earth, for the Lord has spoken. I mean, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about life forever. It just isn't clear at that time. It hasn't been revealed. They didn't have an understanding mm-hmm. of a death of a Messiah. Yeah. In fact, a Messiah who would be crucified on a tree, cursed is he who is on a tree. That's a stumbling block for Jews yeah. because how can the Messiah be cursed? Mm. And that's what needs to be worked through. Yeah. Yeah, I always learn so much when you guys come in. Thank you so much for doing the show. It's really been a delight once again being together. Yeah. 
It's always good to be with you, Bill. It's uh, been too long for me to be yeah, here. Thank so. you so much. And, and I almost and I all, tried to miss today too, but it's a little ahead of the time. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, all the time we have for at least two Jews and a Gentile. Trevor, Aaron, Matt, and Tom. Thank you so much. We are going to take a short break, and then uh, Vince Miller is in hour two. He's talk about his new book, Essential Elements: Forging Godly Men. That's next. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.